Chapter Twelve of Little Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Men by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Twelve Huckleberries. There was a great clashing of tin pails, much running to and fro, and frequent demands for something to eat one august afternoon for the boys were going huckleberrying and made as much stir about it as if they were setting out to find the northwest passage now my lads get off as quietly as you can for rob is safely out of the way and won't see you said mrs bear as she tied daisy's broad-brimmed hat and settled the great blue pinafore in which she had enveloped nan but the plan did not succeed for rob had heard the bustle decided to go and prepared himself without a thought of disappointment the troop was just getting under way when the little man came marching downstairs with his best hat on a bright tin pail in his hand and a face beaming with satisfaction oh dear now we shall have a scene sighed mrs bear who found her eldest son very hard to manage at times i'm all ready said rob and took his place in the ranks with such perfect unconsciousness of his mistake that it really was very hard to undeceive him it's too far for you my love stay and take care of me for i shall be all alone began his mother you've got teddy i'm a big boy so i can go you said i might when i was bigger and i am now persisted rob with a cloud beginning to dim the brightness of his happy face we're going up to the pasture and it's ever so far we don't want you tagging on cried jack who did not admire the little boys i won't tag i'll run and keep up oh mamma let me go i want to fill my new pail and i'll bring em all to you please please i will be good prayed robbie looking up at his mother so grieved and disappointed that her heart began to fail her but my dearie you'll get so tired and hot you won't have a good time wait till i go and then we will stay all day and pick as many berries as you want you never do you are so busy i'm tired of waiting i'd rather go <laughs> and get the fairies for you all myself i love to pick them and i want to fill my new pail dreadfully sobbed rob the pathetic sight of great tears tinkling into the dear new pail and threatening to fill it with salt water instead of huckleberries touched all the ladies present his mother patted the weeper on his back Daisy offered to stay home with him, and Nan said, in her decided way, "'Let him come. I'll take care of him.' "'If Franz was going, I wouldn't mind, for he is very careful. But he is haying with the father, and I'm not sure about the rest of you,' began Mrs. Bear. "'It's so far,' put in Jack. "'I'd carry him if I was going. Wish I was,' said Dan, with a sigh thank you dear but you must take care of your foot i wish i could go stop a minute i think i can manage it after all and mrs bear ran out to the steps waving her apron wildly silas was just driving away in the hay-cart but turned back and agreed at once when mrs joe proposed that he should take the whole party to the pasture and go for them at five o'clock it will delay your work a little but never mind we will pay you in huckleberry pies said mrs joe knowing silas's weak point his rough brown face brightened up and he said with a cheery ho ho all now miss bear if you go to bribeman of me i shall give in right away now boys i have arranged it so that you can all go said mrs bear running back again much relieved for she loved to make them happy and always felt miserable when she had disturbed the serenity of her little sons for she believed that the small hopes and plans and pleasures of children should be tenderly respected by grown-up people and never rudely thwarted or ridiculed can i go 
said Dan, delighted. I thought especially of you. Be careful and never mind the berries, but sit about and enjoy the lovely things which you know how to find all about you, answered Mrs. Bear, who remembered his kind offer to her boy. Me too, me too, sung Rob, dancing with joy and clapping his precious pail and cover like castanets. Yes, and Daisy and Nan must take good care of you. Be at the bars at five o'clock, and Silas will come for you all. Robbie cast himself upon his mother in a burst of gratitude, promising to bring her every berry he picked and not eat one. Then they were all packed into the hay cart and went rattling away, the brightest face among the dozen being that of Rob, as he sat between his two temporary little mothers, beaming upon the whole world and waving his best hat, for his indulgent mamma had not the heart to bereave him of it, since this was a gala day to him. Such a happy afternoon as they had, in spite of the mishaps which usually occur on such expeditions. Of course Tommy came to grief, tumbled upon a hornet's nest and got stung, but being used to woe, he bore the smart manfully, till Dan suggested the application of damp earth, which much assuaged the pain. Daisy saw a snake, and flying from it lost half her berries, but Demi helped her to fill up again, and discussed reptiles most learnedly the while. Ned fell out of a tree, and split his jacket down the back, but suffered no other fracture. Emil and Jack established rival claims to a certain thick patch, and while they were squabbling about it, Stuffy quickly and quietly stripped the bushes and fled to the protection of Dan, who was enjoying himself immensely. The crutch was no longer necessary, and he was delighted to see how strong his foot felt as he roamed about the great pasture, full of interesting rocks and stumps, with familiar little creatures in the grass and well-known insects dancing in the air. But of all the adventures that happened on this afternoon, that which befell Nan and Rob was the most exciting, and it long remained one of the favorite histories of the household. Having explored the country pretty generally, torn three rents in her frock, and scratched her face in a barberry bush, Nan began to pick the berries that shone like big black beads on the low green bushes. Her nimble fingers flew, but still her basket did not fill up as rapidly as she desired, so she kept wandering here and there to search for better places, instead of picking contentedly and steadily as Daisy did. Rob followed Nan, for her energy suited him better than his cousin's patience, and he too was anxious to have the biggest and best berries for Marmar. I keep putting them in, but it don't fill up. And I'm so tired, said Rob, pausing a moment to rest his short legs, and beginning to think huckleberrying was not all his fancy painted it. For the sun blazed, Nan skipped hither and thither like a grasshopper, and the berries fell out of his pail almost as fast as he put them in, because, in his struggles with the bushes, it was often upside down. Last time we came they were ever so much thicker over that wall. Great bouncers! And there is a cave there where the boys made a fire. Let's go and fill our things quick and then hide in the cave and let the others find us, proposed Nan, thirsting for adventures. Rob consented, and away they went, scrambling over the wall and running down the sloping fields on the other side till they were hidden among the rocks and underbrush. The berries were thick, and at last the pails were actually full. It was shady and cool down there, and a little spring gave the thirsty children a refreshing drink out of its mossy cup. Now we will go and rest in the cave and eat our lunch, said Nan, well satisfied with her success so far. Do you know the way? asked Rob. Of course I do. I've been once, and I always remember. Didn't I go and get my box all right? That convinced Rob, and he followed blindly as Nan led him over stock and stone, and brought him, after much meandering, to a small recess in the rock, where the blackened stones showed that fires had been made. "'Now isn't it nice?' asked Nan, as she took out a bit of bread and butter, rather damaged by being mixed up with nails, 
fish-hooks, stones, and other foreign substances in the young lady's pocket. Yes. You think they will find us soon? asked Rob, who found the shadowy glen rather dull and began to long for more society. No, I don't, because if I hear them I shall hide and have fun making them find me. Perhaps they won't come. Don't care. I can get home myself. Is it a great way? asked Rob, looking at his little stubby boots, scratched and wet with his long wandering. It's six miles, I guess. Nan's ideas of distance were vague, and her faith in her own powers great. I think we better go now suggested rob presently i shan't till i have picked over my berries and nan began what seemed to rob an endless task oh dear you said you'd take good care of me he sighed as the sun seemed to drop behind the hill all of a sudden well i'm taking good care of you as hard as i can don't be cross child i'll go in a minute said nan who considered five-year-old robbie a mere infant compared to herself so little rob sat looking anxiously about him and waiting patiently for spite of some misgivings he felt great confidence in nan it's going to be night pretty soon he observed as if to himself as a mosquito bit him and the frogs in a neighboring marsh began to pipe up for the evening concert "'My goodness me, so it is! Come right away this minute, or they'll be gone!' cried Nan, looking up from her work, and suddenly perceiving that the sun was down. "'I heard a horn about an hour ago. Maybe they were blowing for us,' said Rob, trudging after his guide as she scrambled up the steep hill. "'Where was it?' asked Nan, stopping short. "'Over in that way.' he pointed with a dirty little finger in an entirely wrong direction. "'Let's go that way and meet them.' And Nan wheeled about and began to trot through the bushes, feeling a trifle anxious, for there were so many cow-paths all about she could not remember which way they came. On they went over stock and stone again, pausing now and then to listen for the horn, which did not blow any more, for it was only the moo of a cow on her way home. "'I don't remember seeing that pile of stones, do you?' asked Nan, as she sat on a wall to rest a moment and take an observation. "'I don't remember anything, but I want to go home.' And Rob's voice had a little tremble in it that made Nan put her arms round him and lift him gently down, saying, in her most capable way, I'm going just as fast as I can, dear. Don't cry, and when we come to the road I'll carry you. There is no road. And Robbie wiped his eyes to look for it. Over by that big tree. Don't you know that's the one Ned tumbled out of? So it is. Maybe they waited for us. I'd like to ride home, wouldn't you? And Robbie brightened up as he plodded along toward the end of the great pasture. No, I'd rather walk, answered Nan feeling quite sure that she would be obliged to do so, and preparing her mind for it. Another long trudge through the fast-deepening twilight and another disappointment, for when they reached the tree they found to their dismay that it was not the one Ned climbed, and no road anywhere appeared. "'Are we lost?' quavered Rob, clasping his pail in despair. "'Not much. I just don't see which way to go, and I guess we'd better call.' So they both shouted till they were hoarse, yet nothing answered but the frogs in full chorus. "'There's another tall tree over there. Perhaps that's the one,' said Nan, whose heart sunk within her, though she still spoke bravely. "'I don't think I can go any more. My boots are so heavy I can't pull them. And Robbie sat down on a stone quite worn out. "'Then we must stay here all night. I don't care much if snakes don't come i'm frightened of snakes i can't stay all night oh dear i don't like to be lost and rob puckered up his face to cry when suddenly a thought occurred to him and he said in a tone of perfect confidence 
Marmar will come and find me. She always does. I ain't afraid now. She won't know where we are. She didn't know I was shut up in the ice house, but she found me. I know she'll come, returned Robbie so trustfully that Nan felt relieved and sat down by him, saying with a remorseful sigh, I wish we hadn't run away. You made me, but I don't mind much. Marmar'll love me just the same, answered Rob, clinging to his sheet anchor when all other hope was gone. I'm so hungry. Let's eat our berries, proposed Nan, after a pause, during which Rob began to nod. So am I, but I can't eat mine, cause I told Marmar I'd keep them all for her. You'll have to eat them if no one comes for us, said Nan, who felt like contradicting everything just then. If we stay here a great many days, we shall eat up all the berries in the field, and then we shall starve, she added grimly. I shall eat sassafras. I know a big tree of it, and Dan told me how squirrels dig up the roots and eat them, and I love to dig, returned Rob, undaunted by the prospect of starvation. Yes, and we can catch frogs and cook them. My father ate some once, and he said they were nice, put in Nan, beginning to find a spice of romance even in being lost in a huckleberry pasture. How could we cook frogs? We haven't got any fire. I don't know. Next time I'll have matches in my pocket, said Nan, rather depressed by this obstacle to the experimented frog cookery. Couldn't we light a fire with a firefly? asked Rob, hopefully, as he watched them flitting to and fro like winged sparks. Let's try and several minutes were pleasantly spent in catching the flies and trying to make them kindle a green twig or two. "'It's a lie to call them fireflies when there isn't a fire in them,' Nan said, throwing one unhappy insect away with scorn, though it shone its best, and obligingly walked up and down the twigs to please the innocent little experimenters. "'Marmire's a good while coming.' said Rob, after another pause, during which they watched the stars overhead, smelt the sweet fern crushed underfoot, and listened to the cricket's serenade. "'I don't see why God made any night. Day is so much pleasanter,' said Nan, thoughtfully. "'It's to sleep in,' answered Rob, with a yawn. "'Then do go to sleep,' said Nan, pettishly. "'I want my own bed. Oh!' I wish I could see Teddy, cried Rob, painfully reminded of home by the soft chirp of birds safe in their little nests. I don't believe your mother will ever find us, said Nan, who was becoming desperate, for she hated patient waiting of any sort. It's so dark she won't see us. It was all black in the ice house, and I was so scared I didn't call her, but she saw me. "'And she will see me now, no matter how dark it is,' returned confiding Rob, standing up to peer into the gloom for the help which never failed him. "'I see her! I see her!' he cried, and ran as fast as his tired legs would take him toward a dark figure slowly approaching. Suddenly he stopped, then turned about, and came stumbling back, screaming in a great panic— no, it's a bear, a big black one, and hid his face in Nan's skirts. For a moment Nan quailed. Even her courage gave out at the thought of a real bear, and she was about to turn and flee in great disorder when a mild Ooh. changed her fear to merriment as she said, laughing, It's a cow, Robbie, the nice black cow we saw this afternoon. The cow seemed to feel that it was not just the thing to meet two little people in her pasture after dark, and the amiable beast paused to inquire into the case. She let them stroke her, and stood regarding them with her soft eyes so mildly that Nan, who feared no animal but a bear, was fired with a desire to milk her. Silas taught me how, and berries and milk would be so nice, 
she said emptying the contents of her pail into her hat and boldly beginning her new task while rob stood by and repeated at her command the poem from mother goose gushy thou bonny let down your milk let down your milk to me and i will give you a gown of silk a gown of silk and a silver tea but the immortal rhyme had little effect for the benevolent cow had already been milked and had only half a gill to give the thirsty children shoo get away you're an old crosspatch cried nan ungratefully as she gave up the attempt in despair and poor molly walked on with a gentle gurgle of surprise and reproof each can have a sip and then we must take a walk we shall go to sleep if we don't and lost people mustn't sleep don't you know how hannah lee in the pretty story slept under the snow and died but there isn't any snow now and it's nice and warm said rob who was not blessed with as lively a fancy as nan no matter we will poke about a little and call some more and then if nobody comes we will hide under the bushes like hop o my thumb and his brothers it was a very short walk however for rob was so sleepy he could not get on and tumbled down so often that nan entirely lost patience being half distracted by the responsibility she had taken upon herself if you tumble down again i'll shake you she said lifting the poor little man up very kindly as she spoke for nan's bark was much worse than her bite please don't it's my boots they keep slipping so and rob manfully checked the sob just ready to break out adding with a plaintive patience that touched nan's heart if the skaters didn't bite me so i could sleep till marmar comes put your head on my lap and i'll cover you up with my apron i'm not afraid of the night said nan sitting down and trying to persuade herself that she did not mind the shadow nor the mysterious rustlings all about her wake me up when she comes said rob and was fast asleep in five minutes with his head in nan's lap under the pinafore the little girl sat for some fifteen minutes staring about her with anxious eyes and feeling as if each second was an hour then a pale light began to glimmer over the hilltop and she said to herself i guess the night is over and morning is coming i'd like to see the sun rise so i'll watch and when it comes up we can find our way home but before the moon's round face peeped above the hill to destroy her hope nan had fallen asleep leaning back in a little bower of tall ferns and was deep in a midsummer night's dream of fireflies and blue aprons mountains of huckleberries and robbie wiping away the tears of a black cow who sobbed i want to go home i want to go home while the children were sleeping peacefully lulled by the drowsy hum of many neighborly mosquitoes the family at home were in a great state of agitation the hay-cart came at five and all but jack emile nan and rob were at the bars ready for it franz drove instead of silas and when the boys told him that the others were going home through the wood he said looking ill-pleased they ought to have left rob to ride he will be tired out by the long walk it's shorter that way and they will carry him said stuffy who was in a hurry for his supper you are sure nan and rob went with them of course they did i saw them getting over the wall and sung out that it was most five and jack called back that they were going the other way explained tommy very well pile in then and away rattled the hay-cart with the tired children and the full pails mrs joe looked sober when she heard of the division of the party and sent franz back with toby to find and bring the little ones home supper was over and the family sitting about in the cool hall as usual when franz came trotting back hot dusty and anxious have they come he called out when halfway up the avenue no and mrs joe flew out of her chair looking so alarmed that every one jumped up and gathered round franz 
I can't find them anywhere. He began, but the words were hardly spoken when a loud, Hello, startled them all, and the next minute Jack and Emil came round the house. Where are Nan and Rob? cried Mrs. Joe, clutching Emil in a way that caused him to think his aunt had suddenly lost her wits. I don't know. They came home with the others, didn't they? He answered quickly. No, George and Tommy said they went with you. Well, they didn't. Haven't seen them. He took a swim in the pond and came by the wood, said Jack, looking alarmed, as well he might. Call Mr. Bear. Get the lanterns and tell Silas I want him. That was all Mrs. Joe said, but they knew what she meant, and flew to obey her orders. In ten minutes Mr. Bear and Silas were off to the wood, and Franz tearing down the road on old Andy to search the great pasture. Mrs. Joe caught up some food from the table, a little bottle of brandy from the medicine closet, took a lantern, and bidding Jack and Emil come with her, and the rest not stir, she trotted away on Toby, never stopping for hat or shawl. She heard someone running after her, but said not a word till, as she paused to call and listen, the light of her lantern shone on Dan's face. "'You hear, I told Jack to come,' she said, half inclined to send him back, much as she needed help. "'I wouldn't let him. He and Emil hadn't had any supper, and I wanted to come more than they did,' he said, taking the lantern from her and smiling up in her face with the steady look in his eyes that made her feel as if, boy though he was, she had someone to depend on. Off she jumped and ordered him on to Toby, in spite of his pleading to walk.' Then they went on again along the dusty, solitary road, stopping every now and then to call and hearken breathlessly for little voices to reply. When they came to the great pasture, other lights were already flitting to and fro like will-o'-the-wisps, and Mr. Bear's voice was heard shouting, Nan! Rob! Rob! Nan! In every part of the field, Silas whistled and roared, Dan plunged here and there on Toby, who seemed to understand the case, and went over the roughest places with unusual docility. Often Mrs. Joe hushed them all, saying, with a sob in her throat, The noise may frighten them. Let me call. Robbie will know my voice. And then she would cry out the beloved little name in every tone of tenderness, till the very echoes whispered it softly, and the winds seemed to waft it willingly but still no answer came. The sky was overcast now, and only brief glimpses of the moon were seen. Heat lightning darted out of the dark clouds now and then, and a faint far-off rumble as of thunder told that a summer storm was brewing. "'Oh, my Robbie, my Robbie!' mourned poor Mrs. Joe, wandering up and down like a pale ghost, while Dan kept beside her like a faithful firefly." What shall I say to Nan's father if she comes to harm? Why did I ever trust my darling so far away? Fritz, do you hear anything? And when a mournful No came back, she wrung her hands so despairingly that Dan sprung down from Toby's back, tied the bridle to the bars, and said in his decided way, They may have gone down the spring. I'm going to look. He was over the wall and away so fast that she could hardly follow him, but when she reached the spot he lowered the lantern and showed her with joy the marks of little feet in the soft ground about the spring. She fell down on her knees to examine the tracks, and then sprung up, saying eagerly, "'Yes, that is the mark of my Robbie's little boots. Come this way, they must have gone on.' such a weary search but now some inexplicable instinct seemed to lead the anxious mother for presently dan uttered a cry and caught up a little shining object lying in the path it was the cover of the new tin pail dropped in the first alarm of being lost mrs joe hugged and kissed it as if it were a living thing and when dan was about to utter a glad shout to bring the others to the spot she stopped him saying as she hurried on no let me find them i let rob go and i want to give him back to his father all myself 
a little farther on nan's hat appeared and after passing the place more than once they came at last upon the babes in the wood both sound asleep dan never forgot the little picture on which the light of his lantern shone that night he thought mrs joe would cry out but she only whispered hush as she softly lifted away the apron and saw the little ruddy face below the berry stained lips were half open as the breath came and went the yellow hair lay damp on the hot forehead and both the chubby hands held fast the little pail still full the sight of the childish harvest treasured through all the troubles of that night for her seemed to touch mrs joe to the heart for suddenly she gathered up her boy and began to cry over him so tenderly yet so heartily that he woke up and at first seemed bewildered then he remembered and hugged her close saying with a laugh of triumph i knew you come oh marmar i did want you so for a moment they kissed and clung to one another quite forgetting all the world for no matter how lost and soiled and worn out wandering sons may be mothers can forgive and forget everything as they fold them in their fostering arms happy the son whose faith in his mother remains unchanged and who through all his wanderings has kept some filial token to repay her brave and tender love dan meantime picked nan out of her bush and with a gentleness none but teddy ever saw in him before he soothed her first alarm at the sudden waking and wiped away her tears for nan also began to cry for joy it was so good to see a kind face and feel a strong arm round her after what seemed to her ages of loneliness and fear my poor little girl don't cry you are all safe now and no one shall say a word of blame to-night said mrs joe taking nan into her capacious embrace and cuddling both children as a hen might gather her lost chickens under her motherly wings it was my fault but i am sorry i tried to take care of him and i covered him up and let him sleep and didn't touch his berries but i was so hungry and i never will do it again truly never never sobbed nan quite lost in a sea of penitence and thankfulness call them now and let us get home said mrs joe and dan getting upon the wall sent a joyful word found ringing over the field how the wandering lights came dancing from all sides and gathered round the little group among the sweet fern bushes such a hugging and kissing and talking and crying as went on must have amazed the glow-worms and evidently delighted the mosquitoes for they hummed frantically while the little moths came in flocks to the party and the frogs croaked as if they could not express their satisfaction loudly enough then they set out for home a queer party for franz rode on to tell the news dan and toby led the way then came nan in the strong arms of silas who considered her the smartest little baggage he ever saw and teased her all the way home about her pranks mr bear would let no one carry rob but himself and the little fellow refreshed by sleep sat up and chattered gaily feeling himself a hero while his mother went beside him holding on to any part of his precious little body that came handy and never tired of hearing him say i knew my mar would come or seeing him lean down to kiss her and put a plump berry into her mouth cause he picked em all for her the moon shone out just as they reached the avenue and all the boys came shouting to meet them so the lost lambs were born in triumph and safety and landed in the dining-room where the unromantic little things demanded supper instead of preferring kisses and caresses they were set down to bread and milk while the entire household stood round to gaze upon them nan soon recovered her spirits and recounted her perils with a relish now that they were all over rob seemed absorbed in his food but put down his spoon all of a sudden and set up a doleful roar my precious why do you cry asked his mother who still hung over him i'm 
crying because I was what? Bald Rob, trying to squeeze out a tear and failing entirely. But you are found now. Nan says you didn't cry out in the field. I was glad you were such a brave boy. I was so busy being frightened I didn't have any time then. But I want to cry now because I don't like to be lost. Explained Rob, struggling with sleep, emotion, and a mouthful of bread and milk. The boys set up such a laugh at this funny way of making up for lost time that Rob stopped to look at them, and the merriment was so infectious that after a surprise stare he burst out into a merry <laughs> and beat his spoon upon the table as if he enjoyed the joke immensely. It is ten o'clock. Into bed, every man of you, said Mr. Bear, looking at his watch. And thank heaven! There will be no empty ones tonight, added Mrs. Bear, watching with full eyes Robbie going up in his father's arms, and Nan escorted by Daisy and Demi, who considered her the most interesting heroine of their collection. Poor Aunt Jo is so tired she ought to be carried up herself, said gentle Franz, putting his arm round her as she paused at the stair foot, looking quite exhausted by her fright and long walk. Let's make an armchair, proposed Tommy. No, thank you, my lads, but somebody may lend me a shoulder to lean on, answered Mrs. Joe. Me, 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 me! And half a dozen jostled one another, all eager to be chosen, for there was something in the pale motherly face that touched the warm hearts under the round jackets. Seeing that they considered it an honor, Mrs. Joe gave it to the one who had earned it, and nobody grumbled when she put her arm on Dan's broad shoulder, saying, with a look that made him color up with pride and pleasure, He found the children, so I think he must help me up. Dan felt richly rewarded for his evening's work, not only that he was chosen from all the rest to go proudly up bearing the lamp, but because Mrs. Joe said heartily, Good night, my boy. God bless you. As he left her at her door. I wish I was your boy, said Dan, who felt as if danger and trouble had somehow brought him nearer than ever to her. You shall be my oldest son. And she sealed her promise with a kiss that made Dan hers entirely. Little Rob was all right next day, but Nan had a headache and lay on Mother Bear's sofa with cold cream upon her scratched face. Her remorse was quite gone, and she evidently thought being lost rather a fine amusement. Mrs. Joe was not pleased with this state of things, and had no desire to have her children led from the paths of virtue, or her pupils lying round loose in huckleberry fields. So she talked soberly to Nan, and tried to impress upon her mind the difference between liberty and license, telling several tales to enforce her lecture. She had not decided how to punish Nan, but one of these stories suggested a way, and, as Mrs. Joe liked odd penalties, she tried it. "'All children run away,' pleaded Nan, as if it was as natural and necessary a thing as measles or whooping cough." "'Not all, and some who do run away don't get found again,' answered Mrs. Joe. "'Didn't you do it yourself?' asked Nan, whose keen little eyes saw some traces of a kindred spirit in the serious lady who was sewing so morally before her. Mrs. Joe laughed and owned that she did. "'Tell about it,' demanded Nan, feeling that she was getting the upper hand in the discussion." Mrs. Joe saw that, and sobered down at once, saying, with a remorseful shake of the head, I did it a good many times, and led my poor mother rather a hard life with my pranks till she cured me. How? And Nan sat up with a face full of interest. I had a new pair of shoes once and wanted to show them, so, though I was told not to leave the garden, I ran away and was wandering about all day. It was in the city, and why I wasn't killed, I don't know. Such a time as I had! I frolicked in the park with dogs, sailed boats in the back bay with strange boys, dined with a little Irish beggar girl on salt fish and potatoes, and was found at last fast asleep on a doorstep with my arms around a great dog. 
it was late in the evening and i was as dirty as a little pig and the new shoes were worn out i had travelled so far how nice cried nan looking all ready to go and do it herself it was not nice next day and mrs joe tried to keep her eyes from betraying how much she enjoyed the memory of her early capers did your mother whip you asked nan curiously she never whipped me but once and then she begged my pardon or i don't think i ever should have forgiven her it hurt my feelings so much why did she beg your pardon my father don't because when she had done it i turned round and said well you are mad yourself and ought to be whipped as much as me she looked at me a minute and then her anger all died out and she said as if ashamed you are right joe i am angry and why should i punish you for being in a passion when i set you such a bad example forgive me dear and let us try to help one another in a better way i never forgot it and it did me more good than a dozen rods nan sat thoughtfully turning the little cold cream jar for a minute and mrs joe said nothing but let that idea get well into the busy little mind that was so quick to see and feel what went on about her i like that said nan presently and her face looked less elfish with its sharp eyes inquisitive nose and mischievous mouth what did your mother do to you when you ran away that time she tied me to the bedpost with a long string so that i could not go out of the room and there i stayed all day with the little worn-out shoes hanging up before me to remind me of my fault i should think that would cure anybody cried nan who loved her liberty above all things it did cure me and i think it will you so i am going to try it said mrs joe suddenly taking a ball of strong twine out of a drawer in her work-table nan looked as if she was decidedly getting the worst of the argument now and sat feeling much crestfallen while mrs joe tied one end round her waist and the other to the arm of the sofa saying as she finished i don't like to tie you up like a naughty little dog but if you don't remember any better than a dog i must treat you like one i just as lief be tied up as not i like to play dog and nan put on a don't care face and began to growl and grovel on the floor mrs joe took no notice but leaving a book or two and a handkerchief to him she went away and left miss nan to her own devices this was not agreeable and after sitting a moment she tried to untie the cord but it was fastened in the belt of her apron behind so she began on the knot at the other end it soon came loose and gathering it up nan was about to get out of the window when she heard mrs joe say to somebody as she passed through the hall no i don't think she will run away now she is an honourable little girl and knows that i do it to help her in a minute nan whisked back tied herself up and began to sew violently rob came in a moment after and was so charmed with the new punishment that he got a jump rope and tethered himself to the other arm of the sofa in the most social manner i got lost too so i ought to be tied up as much as nan he explained to his mother when she saw the new captive i'm not sure that you don't deserve a little punishment for you knew it was wrong to go far away from the rest nan took me began rob willing to enjoy the novel penalty but not willing to take the blame you needn't have gone you have got a conscience though you are a little boy and you must learn to mind it well my conscience didn't prick me a bit when she said let's go over the wall answered rob quoting one of demi's expressions did you stop to see if it did no then you cannot tell i guess it's such a little conscience that it don't prick hard enough for me to feel it added rob after thinking the matter over for a minute we must sharpen it up it's bad to have a dull conscience so you may stay here till dinner-time and talk about it with nan i trust you both not to untie yourselves till i say the word no, no we, we won't. won't said both feeling a certain sense of virtue in helping to punish themselves for an hour they were very good then they grew tired of one room and longed to get out never had the hall seemed so inviting 
even the little bedroom acquired a sudden interest and they would gladly have gone in and played tent with the curtains of the best bed the open windows drove them wild because they could not reach them and the outer world seemed so beautiful they wondered how they ever found the heart to say it was dull nan pined for a race round the lawn and rob remembered with dismay that he had not fed his dog that morning and wondered what poor pollux would do they watched the clock and nan did some nice calculations in minutes and seconds while rob learned to tell all the hours between eight and one so well that he never forgot them it was maddening to smell the dinner to know that there was to be succotash and huckleberry pudding and to feel that they would not be on the spot to secure good helps of both when mary ann began to set the table they nearly cut themselves in two trying to see what meat there was to be and nan offered to help her make the beds if she would only see that she had lots of sauce on her pudding when the boys came bursting out of school they found the children tugging at their halters like a pair of restive little colts and were much edified as well as amused by the sequel to the exciting adventures of the night untie me now mar mar my conscience will prick like a pan next time i know it will said rob as the bell rang and teddy came to look at him with sorrowful surprise we shall see answered his mother setting him free he took a good run down the hall back through the dining-room and brought up beside nan quite beaming with virtuous satisfaction i'll bring her dinner to her may i he asked pitying his fellow-captive that's my kind little son yes pull out the table and get a chair and Mrs. Joe hurried away to quell the ardor of the others, who were always in a raging state of hunger at noon. Nan ate alone, and spent a long afternoon attached to the sofa. Mrs. Bear lengthened her bonds so that she could look out of the window, and there she stood watching the boys play, and all the little summer creatures enjoying their liberty daisy had a picnic for the dolls on the lawn so that nan might see the fun if she could not join in it tommy turned his best somersaults to console her demi sat on the steps reading aloud to himself which amused nan a good deal and dan brought a little tree toad to show her as the most delicate attention in his power but nothing atoned for the loss of freedom and a few hours of confinement taught nan how precious it was a good many thoughts went through the little head that lay on the window-sill during the last quiet hour when all the children went to the brook to see emile's new ship launched she was to have christened it and had depended on smashing a tiny bottle of currant wine over the prow as it was named josephine in honor of mrs bear now she had lost her chance and daisy wouldn't do it half so well tears rose to her eyes as she remembered that it was all her own fault and she said aloud addressing a fat bee who was rolling about in the yellow heart of a rose just under the window if you have run away you'd better go right home and tell your mother you're sorry and never do so any more i am glad to hear you give him such good advice and i think he has taken it said mrs joe smiling as the bee spread his dusty wings and flew away nan brushed off a bright drop or two that shone on the window-sill and nestled against her friend as she took her on her knee adding kindly for she had seen the little drops and knew what they meant do you think my mother's cure for running away a good one yes ma'am answered nan quite subdued by her quiet day i hope i shall not have to try it again i guess not and nan looked up with such an earnest little face that mrs joe felt satisfied and said no more for she liked to have her penalties do their own work and did not spoil the effect by too much moralizing here rob appeared bearing with infinite care what asia called a sarsa pie meaning one baked in a saucer it's made out of some of my bearing and i'm going to give you half at supper time he announced with a flourish what makes you when i'm so naughty asked nan meekly because we got lost together you ain't going to be naughty again are you 
never said nan with great decision oh goody now let's go and get mary ann to cut this for us all ready to eat it's most tea time and rob beckoned with the delicious little pie nan started to follow then stopped and said i forgot i can't go try and see said mrs bear who had quietly untied the cord sash while she had been talking nan saw that she was free and with one tempestuous kiss to mrs joe she was off like a hummingbird followed by robbie dribbling huckleberry juice as he ran End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Little Men」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Men by Louisa May Alcott Chapter Thirteen Goldilocks After the last excitement, peace descended upon Plumfield and reigned unbroken for several weeks, for the elder boys felt that the loss of Nan and Rob lay at their door, and all became so paternal in their care that they were rather wearying, while the little ones listened to Nan's recital of her perils so many times that they regarded being lost as the greatest ill humanity was heir to, and hardly dared to put their little noses outside the great gate, lest night should suddenly descend upon them, and ghostly black cows come looming through the dusk. "'It is too good to last.' said mrs joe for years of boy culture had taught her that such lulls were usually followed by outbreaks of some sort and when less wise women would have thought that the boys had become confirmed saints she prepared herself for a sudden eruption of the domestic volcano one cause of this welcome calm was a visit from little bess whose parents lent her for a week while they were away with grandpa lawrence who was poorly the boys regarded Goldilocks as a mixture of child, angel, and fairy, for she was a lovely little creature, and the golden hair which she inherited from her blonde mamma enveloped her like a shining veil, behind which she smiled upon her worshippers when gracious, and hid herself when offended. Her father would not have it cut, and it hung below her waist, so soft and fine and bright that Demi insisted that it was silk spun from a cocoon. Every one praised the little princess, but it did not seem to do her harm, only to teach her that her presence brought sunshine, her smiles made answering smiles on other faces, and her baby griefs filled every heart with tenderest sympathy unconsciously she did her young subjects more good than many a real sovereign for her rule was very gentle and her power was felt rather than seen her natural refinement made her dainty in all things and had a good effect upon the careless lads about her she would let no one touch her roughly or with unclean hands and more soap was used during her visits than at any other time because the boys considered it the highest honor to be allowed to carry her highness and the deepest disgrace to be repulsed with the disdainful command go away dirty boy loud voices displeased her and quarrelling frightened her so gentler tones came into the boyish voices as they addressed her and squabbles were promptly suppressed in her presence by lookers-on if the principals could not restrain themselves she liked to be waited on and the biggest boys did her little errands without a murmur while the small lads were her devoted slaves in all things they begged to be allowed to draw her carriage bear her berry basket or pass her plate at table no service was too humble and tommy and ned came to blows before they could decide which should have the honor of blacking her little boots nan was especially benefited by a week in the society of a well-bred lady though such a very small one 
for bess would look at her with a mixture of wonder and alarm in her great blue eyes when the hoyden screamed and romped and she shrunk from her as if she thought her a sort of wild animal warm-hearted nan felt this very much she said at first pooh i don't care but she did care and was so hurt when bess said i love my tarzan best cause she is quiet that she shook poor daisy till her teeth chattered in her head and then fled to the barn to cry dismally in that general refuge for perturbed spirits she found comfort and good counsel from some source or other perhaps the swallows from their mud-built nests overhead twittered her a little lecture on the beauty of gentleness however that might have been she came out quite subdued and carefully searched the orchard for a certain kind of early apple that bess liked because it was sweet and small and rosy armed with this peace offering she approached the little princess and humbly presented it to her great joy it was graciously accepted and when daisy gave nan a forgiving kiss bess did likewise as if she felt that she had been too severe and desired to apologize after this they played pleasantly together and nan enjoyed the royal favor for days to be sure she felt a little like a wild bird in a pretty cage at first and occasionally had to slip out to stretch her wings in a long flight or to sing at the top of her voice where neither would disturb the plump turtle dove daisy nor the dainty golden canary bess but it did her good for seeing how every one loved the little princess for her small graces and virtues she began to imitate her because nan wanted much love and tried hard to win it not a boy in the house but felt the pretty child's influence and was improved by it without exactly knowing how or why for babies can work miracles in the hearts that love them poor billy found infinite satisfaction in staring at her and though she did not like it she permitted without a frown after she had been made to understand that he was not quite like the others and on that account must be more kindly treated dick and dolly overwhelmed her with willow whistles the only thing they knew how to make and she accepted but never used them rob served her like a little lover and teddy followed her like a pet dog jack she did not like because he was afflicted with warts and had a harsh voice stuffy displeased her because he did not eat tidily and george tried hard not to gobble that he might not disgust the dainty little lady opposite ned was banished from court in utter disgrace when he was discovered tormenting some unhappy field mice goldilocks could never forget the sad spectacle and retired behind her veil when he approached waving him away with an imperious little hand and crying in a tone of mingled grief and anger no i don't love him he cut the poor mouse's little tails off and they queaked daisy promptly abdicated when bess came and took the humble post of chief cook while nan was first maid of honor emile was chancellor of the exchequer and spent the public monies lavishly in getting up spectacles that cost whole ninepences franz was prime minister and directed her affairs of state planned royal progresses through the kingdom and kept foreign powers in order demi was her philosopher and fared much better than such gentlemen usually do among crowned heads dan was her standing army and defended her territories gallantly tommy was court fool and nat a tuneful rizzio to this innocent little mary uncle fritz and aunt joe enjoyed this peaceful episode and looked on at the pretty play in which the young folk unconsciously imitated their elders without adding the tragedy that is so apt to spoil the dramas acted on the larger stage they teach us quite as much as we teach them said mr bear bless the dears they never guess how many hints they give us as to the best way of managing them answered mrs joe i think you were right about the good effect of having girls among the boys nan has stirred up daisy and bess is teaching the little bears how to behave better than we can 
if this reformation goes on as it has begun, I shall soon feel like Dr. Blimmer with his model young gentleman, said the professor, laughing, as he saw Tommy not only remove his own hat, but knock off Ned's also, as they entered the hall where the princess was taking a ride on the rocking horse, attended by Rob and Teddy astride of chairs, and playing gallant knights to the best of their ability you will never be a blimber fritz you couldn't do it if you tried and our boys will never submit to the forcing process of that famous hotbed no fear that they will be too elegant american boys like liberty too well but good manners they cannot fail to have if we give them the kindly spirit that shines through the simplest demeanour making it courteous and cordial like yours my dear old boy tut tut we will not compliment for if i begin you will run away and I have a wish to enjoy this happy half-hour to the end. Yet Mr. Bear looked pleased with the compliment, for it was true, and Mrs. Joe felt that she had received the best her husband could give her by saying that he found his truest rest and happiness in her society. To return to the children, I have just had another proof of Goldilocks' good influence said mrs joe drawing her chair nearer the sofa where the professor lay resting after a long day's work in his various gardens nan hates sewing but for love of bess has been toiling half the afternoon over a remarkable bag in which to present a dozen of our love apples to her idol when she goes i praised her for it and she said in her quick way i like to sew for other people it is stupid sewing for myself I took the hint and shall give her some little shirts and aprons for Mrs. Carney's children. She is so generous she will sew her fingers sore for them, and I shall not have to make a task of it. But needlework is not a fashionable accomplishment, my dear. Sorry for it. My girls shall learn all I can teach them about it, even if they give up the Latin algebra and half a dozen ologies it is considered necessary for girls to muddle their poor brains over nowadays. Amy means to make Bess an accomplished woman, but the deer's mite of a forefinger has little pricks on it already, and her mother has several specimens of needlework which she values more than the clay bird without a bill, that filled Laurie with such pride when Bess made it. I also have proof of the princess's power, said Mr. Bear, after he had watched Mrs. Joe sew on a button with an air of scorn for the whole system of fashionable education. Jack is so unwilling to be classed with Stuffy and Ned so distasteful to Bess, that he came to me a little while ago and asked me to touch his warts with caustic. I have often proposed it, and he never would consent, but now he bore the smart manfully and consoles his present discomfort by hopes of future favor when he can show her fastidious ladyship a smooth hand." mrs bear laughed at the story and just then stuffy came in to ask if he might give goldilocks some of the bonbons his mother had sent him she is not allowed to eat sweeties but if you like to give her the pretty box with the pink sugar rose in it she would like it very much said mrs joe unwilling to spoil this unusual piece of self-denial for the fat boy seldom offered to share his sugar plums won't she eat it I shouldn't like to make her sick, said Stuffy, eyeing the delicate sweetmeat lovingly, yet putting it into the box. Oh, no, she won't touch it if I tell her it is to look at, not to eat. She will keep it for weeks and never think of tasting it. Can you do as much? I should hope so. I'm ever so much older than she is, cried Stuffy indignantly. Well, suppose we try. Here, put your bonbons in this bag and see how long you can keep them. Let me count two hearts, four red fishes, three barley sugar horses, nine almonds, and a dozen chocolate drops. Do you agree to that? Asked sly Mrs. Joe, popping the sweeties into her little spool bag. Yes, said Stuffy with a sigh, and pocketing the forbidden fruit, he went away to give Bess the present, that won a smile from her, and permission to escort her round the garden poor stuffy's heart has really got the better of his stomach at last and his efforts will be much encouraged by the rewards bess gives him said mrs joe happy is the man who can put temptation in his pocket 
and learn self-denial from so sweet a little teacher added mr bear as the children passed the window stuffy's fat face full of placid satisfaction and goldilocks surveying her sugar rose with polite interest though she would have preferred a real flower with a pity smell when her father came to take her home a universal wail arose and the parting gifts showered upon her increased her luggage to such an extent that mr lorry proposed having out the big wagon to take it into town every one had given her something and it was found difficult to pack white mice cake a parcel of shells apples a rabbit kicking violently in a bag a large cabbage for his refreshment a bottle of minnows and a mammoth bouquet the farewell scene was moving for the princess sat upon the hall table surrounded by her subjects she kissed her cousins and held out her hand to the other boys who shook it gently with various soft speeches for they were taught not to be ashamed of showing their emotions come again soon little dear whispered dan fastening his best green and gold beetle in her hat don't forget me princess whatever you do said the engaging tommy taking a last stroke of the pretty hair i am coming to your house next week and then i shall see you bess added nat as if he found consolation in the thought do shake hands now cried jack offering a smooth paw here are two nice new ones to remember us by said dick and dolly presenting fresh whistles quite unconscious that seven old ones had been privately deposited in the kitchen stove my little precious i shall work you a bookmark right away and you must keep it always said nan with a warm embrace but of all the farewells poor billy's was the most pathetic for the thought that she was really going became so unbearable that he cast himself down before her hugging her little blue boots and blubbering despairingly don't go away oh don't goldilocks was so touched by this burst of feeling that she leaned over and lifting the poor lad's head said in her soft little voice don't cry poor billy i will kiss you and tell my dane soon this promise consoled billy and he fell back beaming with pride at the unusual honor conferred upon him me, me too, too me, me too. too clamored dick and dolly feeling that their devotion deserved some return the others looked as if they would like to join in the cry and something in the kind merry faces about her moved the princess to stretch out her arms and say with reckless condescension i will kiss everybody like a swarm of bees about a very sweet flower the affectionate lads surrounded their pretty playmate and kissed her till she looked like a little rose not roughly but so enthusiastically that nothing but the crown of her hat was visible for a moment then her father rescued her and she drove away still smiling and waving her hands while the boys sat on the fence screaming like a flock of guinea fowls come back come, come back, back till she was out of sight they all missed her and each dimly felt that he was better for having known a creature so lovely delicate and sweet for little bess appealed to the chivalrous instinct in them as something to love admire and protect with a tender sort of reverence many a man remembers some pretty child who has made a place in his heart and kept her memory alive by the simple magic of her innocence these little men were just learning to feel this power and to love it for its gentle influence not ashamed to let the small hand lead them nor to own their loyalty to womankind even in the bud End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Little Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Men by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Fourteen Damon and Pythias. Mrs. Bear was right. 
peace was only a temporary lull a storm was brewing and two days after bess left a moral earthquake shook plumfield to its centre tommy's hens were at the bottom of the trouble for if they had not persisted in laying so many eggs he could not have sold them and made such sums money is the root of all evil and yet it is such a useful root that we cannot get on without it any more than we can without potatoes tommy certainly could not for he spent his income so recklessly that mr bear was obliged to insist on a savings bank and presented him with a private one an imposing tin edifice with the name over the door and a tall chimney down which the pennies were to go there to rattle temptingly till leave was given to open a sort of trap-door in the floor the house increased in weight so rapidly that tommy soon became satisfied with his investment and planned to buy unheard-of treasures with his capital he kept account of the sums deposited and was promised that he might break the bank as soon as he had five dollars on condition that he spent the money wisely only one dollar was needed and the day mrs joe paid him for four dozen eggs he was so delighted that he raced off to the barn to display the bright quarters to nat who was also laying by money for the long-desired violin i wish i had em to put with my three dollars then i'd soon get enough to buy my fiddle he said looking wistfully at the money perhaps i'll lend you some i haven't yet decided what i'll do with mine said tommy tossing up his quarters and catching them as they fell hi boys come down to the brook and see what a jolly great snake dan's got called a voice from behind the barn come on said tommy and laying his money inside the old winnowing machine away he ran followed by nat the snake was very interesting, and then a long chase after a lame crow and its capture so absorbed Tommy's mind and time that he never thought of his money till he was safely in bed that night. Never mind, no one but Nat knows where it is, said the easy-going lad, and fell asleep, untroubled by any anxiety about his property next morning just as the boys assembled for school tommy rushed into the room breathlessly demanding i say who has got my dollar what are you talking about asked franz tommy explained and nat corroborated his statement everyone else declared they knew nothing about it and began to look suspiciously at nat who got more and more alarmed and confused with each denial somebody must have taken it said franz as tommy shook his fist at the whole party and wrathfully declared that by thunder turtles if i get hold of the thief i'll give him what he won't forget in a hurry keep cool tom we shall find him out thieves always come to grief said dan as one who knew something of the matter maybe some tramp slept in the barn and took it suggested ned no sons don't allow that besides a tramp wouldn't go looking in that old machine for money said emile with scorn wasn't it silas himself said jack well i like that old si is as honest as daylight you wouldn't catch him touching a penny of ours said tommy handsomely defending his chief admirer from suspicion whoever it was had better tell and not wait to be found out said demi looking as if an awful misfortune had befallen the family i know you think it's me broke out nat red and excited you're the only one who knew where it was said franz i can't help it i didn't take it i tell you i didn't i didn't cried nat in a desperate sort of way gently gently my son what is all this noise about and mr bear walked in among them tommy repeated the story of his loss and as he listened mr bear's face grew graver and graver for with all their faults and follies the lads till now had been honest take your seats he said and when all were in their places he added slowly as his eye went from face to face with a grieved look that was harder to bear than a storm of words now boys I shall ask each one of you a single question. 
and I want an honest answer. I am not going to try to frighten, bribe, or surprise the truth out of you, for every one of you have got a conscience and know what it is for. Now is the time to undo the wrong done to Tommy, and set yourselves right before us all. I can forgive the yielding to sudden temptation much easier than I can deceit. Don't add a lie to the theft, but confess frankly, and we will all try to help you make us forget and forgive. He paused a moment, and one might have heard a pin drop. The room was so still. Then, slowly and impressively, he put the question to each one, receiving the same answer in varying tones from all. Every face was flushed and excited, so that Mr. Bear could not take color as a witness, and some of the little boys were so frightened that they stammered over the two short words as if guilty, though it was evident that they could not be. When he came to Nat, his voice softened, for the poor lad looked so wretched, Mr. Bear felt for him. He believed him to be the culprit, and hoped to save the boy from another lie, by winning him to tell the truth without fear. Now, my son, give me an honest answer. Did you take the money? No, sir. And Nat looked up at him imploringly. As the words fell from his trembling lips, somebody hissed. Stop that! cried Mr. Bear, with a sharp rap on his desk, as he looked sternly toward the corner whence the sound came. Ned, Jack, and Emile sat there, and the first two looked ashamed of themselves, but Emile called out, "'It wasn't me, Uncle. I'd be ashamed to hit a fellow when he is down.' "'Good for you!' cried Tommy, who was in a sad state of affliction at the trouble his unlucky dollar had made. "'Silence!' commanded mr bear and when it came he said soberly i am very sorry nat but evidences are against you and your old fault makes us more ready to doubt you than we should be if we could trust you as we do some of the boys who never fib but mind my child i do not charge you with this theft i shall not punish you for it till i am perfectly sure nor ask anything more about it I shall leave it for you to settle with your own conscience. If you are guilty, come to me at any hour of the day or night and confess it, and I will forgive and help you to amend. If you are innocent, the truth will appear sooner or later, and the instant it does, I will be the first to beg your pardon for doubting you, and will so gladly do my best to clear your character before us all. I didn't, I didn't, sobbed Nat, with his head down upon his arms, for he could not bear the look of distrust and dislike which he read in the many eyes fixed on him. I hope not. Mr. Bear paused a minute, as if to give the culprit, whoever he might be, one more chance. Nobody spoke, however, and only sniffs of sympathy from some of the little fellows broke the silence. Mr. Bear shook his head and added, regretfully, There is nothing more to be done, then. But I have but one thing to say. I shall not speak of this again, and I wish you all to follow my example. I cannot expect you to feel as kindly toward anyone whom you suspect as before this happened, but I do expect and desire that you will not torment the suspected person in any way. He will have a hard enough time without that. Now go to your lessons. Father Bear let Nat off too easy, muttered Ned to Emile as they got out their books. Hold your tongue, growled Emile, who felt that this event was a blot upon the family honor. Many of the boys agreed with Ned, but Mr. Bear was right nevertheless, and Nat would have been wiser to confess on the spot and have the trouble over, for even the hardest whipping he ever received from his father was far easier to bear than the cold looks, the avoidance, and the general suspicion that met him on all sides. If ever a boy was sent to Coventry and kept there, it was poor Nat, and he suffered a week of slow torture, though not a hand was raised against him, and hardly a word said. 
that was the worst of it if they would only have talked it out or even have thrashed him all round he could have stood it better than the silent distrust that made every face so terrible to meet even mrs bears showed traces of it though her manner was nearly as kind as ever but the sorrowful anxious look in father bear's eyes cut nat to the heart for he loved his teacher dearly and knew that he had disappointed all his hopes by this double sin only one person in the house entirely believed in him and stood up for him stoutly against all the rest this was daisy she could not explain why she trusted him against all appearances she only felt that she could not doubt him and her warm sympathy made her strong to take his part she would not hear a word against him from any one and actually slapped her beloved demi when he tried to convince her that it must have been nat because no one else knew where the money was maybe the hens ate it they're greedy old things she said and when demi laughed she lost her temper slapped the amazed boy and then burst out crying and ran away still declaring he didn't he didn't he didn't neither aunt nor uncle tried to shake the child's faith in her friend but only hoped her innocent instinct might prove sure and loved her all the better for it nat often said after it was over that he couldn't have stood it if it had not been for daisy when the others shunned him she clung to him closer than ever and turned her back on the rest she did not sit on the stairs now when he solaced himself with the old fiddle but went in and sat beside him listening with a face so full of confidence and affection that nat forgot disgrace for a time and was happy she asked him to help her with her lessons she cooked him marvellous messes in her kitchen which he ate manfully no matter what they were for gratitude gave a sweet flavour to the most distasteful she proposed impossible games of cricket and ball when she found that he shrank from joining the other boys she put little nosegays from her garden on his desk and tried in every way to show that she was not a fair-weather friend but faithful through evil as well as good repute nan soon followed her example in kindness at least curbed her sharp tongue and kept her scornful little nose from any demonstration of doubt or dislike which was good of madame giddy gaddy for she firmly believed that nat took the money most of the boys let him severely alone but dan though he said he despised him for being a coward watched over him with a grim sort of protection and promptly cuffed any lad who dared to molest his mate or make him afraid his idea of friendship was as high as daisy's and in his own rough way he lived up to it as loyally sitting by the brook one afternoon absorbed in the study of the domestic habits of water spiders he overheard a bit of conversation on the other side of the wall ned who was intensely inquisitive had been on tenterhooks to know certainly who was the culprit for of late one or two of the boys had begun to think that they were wrong nat was so steadfast in his denials and so meek in his endurance of their neglect this doubt had teased ned past bearing and he had several times privately beset nat with questions regardless of mr bear's express command finding nat reading alone on the shady side of the wall ned could not resist stopping for a nibble at the forbidden subject he had worried nat for some ten minutes before dan arrived and the first words the spider student heard were these in nat's patient pleading voice don't ned oh don't i can't tell you because i don't know and it's mean of you to keep nagging at me on the sly when father bear told you not to plague me you wouldn't dare if dan was around why oh, ain't afraid of dan he's nothing but an old bully don't believe but what he took Tom's money, and you know it, and won't tell. Come now. He didn't. But if he did, I would stand up for him. He has always been so good to me.
said nat so earnestly that dan forgot his spiders and rose quickly to thank him but ned's next words arrested him i know dan did it and gave the money to you shouldn't wonder if he got his living picking pockets before he came here for nobody knows anything about him but you said ned not believing his own words but hoping to get the truth out of nat by making him angry he succeeded in a part of his ungenerous wish for nat cried out fiercely if you say that again i'll go and tell mr bear all about it i don't want to tell tales but by george i will if you don't let dan alone then you'll be a sneak as well as a liar and a thief began ned with a jeer for nat had borne insult to himself so meekly the other did not believe he would dare to face the master just to stand up for dan what he might have added i cannot tell for the words were hardly out of his mouth when a long arm from behind took him by the collar and jerking him over the wall in a most promiscuous way landed him with a splash in the middle of the brook say that again and i'll duck you till you can't see cried dan looking like a modern colossus of roads as he stood with a foot on either side of the narrow stream glaring down at the discomfited youth in the water why was only in fun said ned you are a sneak yourself to badger nat round the corner let me catch you at it again and i'll souse you in the river next time get up and clear out thundered dan in a rage ned fled dripping and his impromptu sitz bath evidently did him good for he was very respectful to both the boys after that and seemed to have left his curiosity in the brook as he vanished dan jumped over the wall and found nat lying as if quite worn out and bowed down with his troubles he won't pester you again i guess if he does just tell me and i'll see to him said dan trying to cool down i don't mind what he says about me so much i've got used to it answered nat sadly but i hate to have him pitch into you how'd you know he isn't right asked dan turning his face away what about the money cried nat looking up with a startled air yes but i don't believe it you don't care for money all you want is your old bugs and things and nat laughed incredulously i want a butterfly net as much as you want a fiddle why should i steal the money for it as much as you said dan still turning away and busily punching holes in the turf with his stick i don't think you would you like to fight and knock folks round sometimes but you don't lie and i don't believe you'd steal and nat shook his head decidedly i've done both i used to fib like fury it's too much trouble now and i stole things to eat out of gardens when i ran away from page so you see i'm a bad lot said dan speaking in the rough reckless way which he had been learning to drop lately oh dan don't say it's you i'd rather have it any of the other boys cried nat in such a distressed tone that dan looked pleased and showed that he did by turning round with a queer expression in his face though he only answered i won't say anything about it but don't you fret and we'll pull through somehow see if we don't something in his face and manner gave nat a new idea and he said pressing his hands together in the eagerness of his appeal i think you know who did it if you do beg him to tell dan it's so hard to have em all hate me for nothing i don't think i can bear it much longer if i had any place to go i'd run away though i love plumfield dearly but i'm not brave and big like you so i must stay and wait till someone shows them that i haven't lied as he spoke nat looked so broken and despairing that dan could not bear it and muttered huskily you won't wait long and he walked rapidly away and was seen no more for hours what is, what is the matter, matter with dan, dan? asked the boys of one another several times during the sunday that followed a week which seemed as if it would never end dan was often moody but that day he was so sober and silent that no one could get anything out of him 
when they walked he strayed away from the rest and came home late he took no part in the evening conversation but sat in the shadow so busy with his own thoughts that he scarcely seemed to hear what was going on when mrs joe showed him an unusually good report in the conscience book he looked at it without a smile and said wistfully you think i'm getting on don't you excellently dan and i am so pleased because i always thought you only needed a little help to make you a boy to be proud of he looked up at her with a strange expression in his black eyes an expression of mingled pride and love and sorrow which she could not understand then but remembered afterward i'm afraid you'll be disappointed but i do try he said shutting the book with no sign of pleasure in the page that he usually liked so much to read over and talk about are you sick dear asked mrs joe with her hand on his shoulder my foot aches a little i guess i'll go to bed good night mother he added and held the hand against his cheek a minute then went away looking as if he had said good-bye to something dear poor dan he takes nat's disgrace to heart sadly he is a strange boy i wonder if i shall ever understand him thoroughly said mrs joe to herself as she thought over dan's late improvement with real satisfaction yet felt that there was more in the lad than she had at first suspected one of the things which cut nat most deeply was an act of tommy's for after his loss tommy had said to him kindly but firmly i don't wish to hurt you nat but you see i can't afford to lose my money so i guess we won't be partners any longer and with that tommy rubbed out the sign t bangs and co nat had been very proud of the co and had hunted eggs industriously kept his accounts all straight and had added a good sum to his income from the sale of his share of stock in trade oh tom must you he said feeling that his good name was gone forever in the business world if this was done i must returned tommy firmly emil says that when one man bezels believe that's the word it means to take money and cut away with it the property of a firm the other one sues him or pitches into him somehow and won't have anything more to do with him now you have bezeled my property i shan't sue you and i shan't pitch into you but i must dissolve the partnership because i can't trust you and i don't wish to fail i can't make you believe me and you won't take my money though i'd be thankful to give you all my dollars if you'd only say you don't think i took your money do let me hunt for you i won't ask any wages but do it for nothing i know all the places and i like it pleaded nat but tommy shook his head and his jolly round face looked suspicious and hard as he said shortly can't do it wish you didn't know the places mind you don't go hunting on the sly and speculate in my eggs poor nat was so hurt that he could not get over it he felt that he had lost not only his partner and patron but that he was bankrupt in honor and an outlaw from the business community no one trusted his word written or spoken in spite of his efforts to redeem the past falsehood the sign was down the firm broken up and he a ruined man the barn which was the boy's wall street knew him no more cockletop and her sisters cackled for him in vain and really seemed to take his misfortune to heart for eggs were fewer and some of the biddies retired in disgust to new nests which tommy could not find they trust me said nat when he heard of it and though the boys shouted at the idea nat found comfort in it for when one is down in the world the confidence of even a speckled hen is most consoling tommy took no new partner however for distrust had entered in and poisoned the peace of his once confiding soul ned offered to join him but he declined saying with a sense of justice that did him honor it might turn out that ned didn't take my money and then we could be partners again i don't think it will happen but i will give him a chance and keep place open a little longer 
Billy was the only person whom Bangs felt he could trust in his shop, and Billy was trained to hunt eggs and hand them over unbroken, being quite satisfied with an apple or a sugar plum for wages. The morning after Dan's gloomy Sunday, Billy said to his employer as he displayed the results of a long hunt, Only two. It gets worse and worse. I never saw such provoking old hens, growled Tommy, thinking of the days when he often had six to rejoice over. Well, put em in my hat and give me a new bit of chalk. I must mark em up anyways. Billy mounted a peck measure and looked into the top of the machine where Tommy kept his writing materials. There's lots of money in here, said Billy. No, there isn't. Catch me leaving my cash around again, returned Tommy. I see em. One, four, eight, two dollars persisted billy who had not yet mastered the figures correctly what a jack you are and tommy hopped up to get the chalk for himself but nearly tumbled down again for there actually were four bright quarters in a row with a bit of paper on them directed to tom bangs that there might be no mistake thunder turtles cried tommy and seizing them he dashed into the house bawling wildly it's all right got my money where's nat he was soon found and his surprise and pleasure were so genuine that few doubted his word when he now denied all knowledge of the money how could i put it back when i didn't take it do believe me that would be good to me again he said so imploringly that emile slapped him on the back and declared he would for one so will i and i'm jolly glad it's not you but who the dickens is it said tommy after shaking hands heartily with nat never mind as long as it's found said dan with his eyes fixed on nat's happy face well i like that i'm not gonna have my things hooked and then brought back like the juggling man's tricks cried tommy looking at his money as if he suspected witchcraft we'll find him out somehow though he was sly enough to print this so his writing wouldn't be known said franz examining the paper danny prints tip-top put in rob who had not a very clear idea what the fuss was all about you can't make me believe it's him not if you talk till you are blue said tommy and the others hooted at the mere idea for the little deacon as they called him was above suspicion nat felt the difference in the way they spoke of demi and himself and would have given all he had or ever hoped to have to be so trusted for he had learned how easy it is to lose the confidence of others how very very hard to win it back and truth became to him a precious thing since he had suffered from neglecting it mr bear was very glad one step had been taken in the right direction and waited hopefully for yet further revelations they came sooner than he expected and in a way that surprised and grieved him very much as they sat at supper that night a square parcel was handed to mrs bear from mrs bates a neighbor a note accompanied the parcel and while mr bear read it Demi pulled off the wrapper, exclaiming, as he saw its contents, "'Why, it's the book Uncle Teddy gave Dan!' "'The devil!' broke from Dan, for he had not yet quite cured himself of swearing, though he tried very hard. Mr. Bear looked up quickly at the sound. Dan tried to meet his eyes, but could not. His own fell, and he sat biting his lips, getting redder and redder till he was the picture of shame what is it asked mrs bear anxiously i should have preferred to talk about this in private but demi has spoilt that plan so i may as well have it out now said mr bear looking a little stern as he always did when any meanness or deceit came up for judgment the note is from mrs bates and she says that her boy jimmy told her he bought this book of dan last saturday she saw that it was worth much more than a dollar and thinking there was some mistake has sent it to me did you sell it dan yes sir was the slow answer why wanted money 
For what? To pay somebody. To whom did you owe it? Tommy. Never borrowed a cent of me in his life, cried Tommy, looking scared, for he guessed what was coming now, and felt that on the whole he would have preferred witchcraft, for he admired Dan immensely. Perhaps he took it, cried Ned, who owed Dan a grudge for the ducking, and, being a mortal boy, liked to pay it off. Oh, Dan, cried Nat, clasping his hands, regardless of the bread and butter in them. It is a hard thing to do, but I must have this settled, for I cannot have you watching each other like detectives, and the whole school disturbed in this way. Did you put that dollar in the barn this morning? asked Mr. Bear. Dan looked him straight in the face and answered steadily. Yes, I did. A murmur went round the table. Tommy dropped his mug with a crash. Daisy cried out. I knew it wasn't Nat! Nan began to cry, and Mrs. Joe left the room, looking so disappointed, sorry, and ashamed that Dan could not bear it. He hid his face in his hands a moment, then threw up his head, squared his shoulders as if settling some load upon them, and said, with the dogged look and half-resolute, half-reckless tone he had used when he first came, I did it. Now you may do what you like to me, but I won't say another word about it. Not even that you are sorry? asked Mr. Bear, troubled by the change in him. I ain't sorry. I'll forgive him with that without asking, said Tommy, feeling that it was harder somehow to see brave Dan disgraced than timid Nat. Don't want to be forgiven, returned Dan gruffly. Perhaps you will when you have thought about it quietly by yourself. I won't tell you now how surprised and disappointed I am, but by and by I will come up and talk to you in your room. Won't make any difference, said Dan, trying to speak defiantly, but failing as he looked at Mr. Bear's sorrowful face, and, taking his words for a dismissal, Dan left the room as if he found it impossible to stay. It would have done him good if he had stayed, for the boys talked the matter over with such sincere regret and pity and wonder it might have touched him and won him to ask pardon. No one was glad to find that it was he, not even Nat, for, spite of all his faults, and they were many, every one liked Dan now, because under his rough exterior lay some of the manly virtues which we most admire and love. Mrs. Joe had been the chief prop as well as cultivator of Dan, and she took it sadly to heart that her last and most interesting boy had turned out so ill. The theft was bad, but the lying about it and allowing another to suffer so much from an unjust suspicion was worse, and most discouraging of all was the attempt to restore the money in an underhand way, for it showed not only a want of courage but a power of deceit that boded ill for the future still more trying was his steady refusal to talk of the matter to ask pardon or express any remorse days passed and he went about his lessons and his work silent grim and unrepentant as if taking warning by their treatment of Nat, he asked no sympathy of any one, rejected the advances of the boys, and spent his leisure hours roaming about the fields and woods, trying to find playmates in the birds and beasts, and succeeding better than most boys would have done, because he knew and loved them so well. If this goes on much longer, I'm afraid he will run away again for he is too young to stand a life like this said mr bear quite dejected at the failure of all his efforts a little while ago i should have been quite sure that nothing would tempt him away but now i am ready of anything he is so changed answered poor mrs joe who mourned over her boy and could not be comforted because he shunned her more than any one else and only looked at her with the half fierce half imploring eyes of a wild animal caught in a trap when she tried to talk to him alone nat followed him about like a shadow and dan did not repulse him as rudely as he did others but said in his blunt way 
You are all right. Don't worry about me. I can stand it better than you did. But I don't like to have you all alone. Nat would say sorrowfully. I like it. And Dan would tramp away, stifling a sigh sometimes, for he was lonely. Passing through the birch grove one day, he came upon several of the boys, who were amusing themselves by climbing up the trees and swinging down again, as the slender elastic stems bent till their tops touched the ground. Dan paused a minute to watch the fun, without offering to join in it, and as he stood there Jack took his turn. He had unfortunately chosen too large a tree, for when he swung off it only bent a little way and left him hanging at a dangerous height. "'Go back! You can't do it!' called Ned from below. Jack tried, but the twigs slipped from his hands, and he could not get his legs round the trunk. He kicked and squirmed and clutched in vain, then gave it up and hung breathless, saying helplessly, "'Catch me! Help me! I must drop!' "'You'll be killed if you do!' cried Ned, frightened out of his wits. "'Hold on!' shouted Dan, and up the tree he went, crashing his way along till he nearly reached Jack, whose face looked up at him, full of fear and hope. "'You both come down,' said Ned, dancing with excitement on the slope underneath, while Nat held out his arms in the wild hope of breaking the fall. "'That's what I want. Stand from under.' answered Dan coolly, and as he spoke his added weight bent the tree many feet nearer the earth. Jack dropped safely, but the birch, lightened of half its load, flew up again so suddenly that Dan, in the act of swinging round to drop feet foremost, lost his hold and fell heavily. "'I'm not hurt. All right in a minute,' he said, sitting up, a little pale and dizzy, as the boys gathered round him, full of admiration and alarm. "'You're a trump, Dan, and I'm ever so much obliged to you,' cried Jack, gratefully. "'It wasn't anything,' muttered Dan, rising slowly. "'I say it was, and I'll shake hands with you, though you are—' Ned checked the unlucky word on his tongue, and held out his hand, feeling that it was a handsome thing on his part. But I won't shake hands with a sneak. And Dan turned his back with a look of scorn that caused Ned to remember the brook and retire with undignified haste. Come home, old chap. I'll give you a lift. And Nat walked away with him, leaving the others to talk over the feet together, to wonder when Dan would come round, and to wish one and all that Tommy's confounded money had been in Jericho before it made such a fuss. When Mr. Bear came into school next morning, he looked so happy that the boys wondered what had happened to him, and really thought he had lost his mind when they saw him go straight to Dan, and— taking him by both hands, say, all in one breath, as he shook them heartily, I know all about it, and I beg your pardon. It was like you to do it, and I love you for it, though it's never right to tell lies, even for a friend. What is it? cried Nat, for Dan said not a word, only lifted up his head, as if a weight of some sort had fallen off his back. Dan did not take Tommy's money and Mr. Bear quite shouted it, he was so glad. Who did it? cried the boys in a chorus. Mr. Bear pointed to one empty seat, and every eye followed his finger, yet no one spoke for a minute, they were so surprised. Jack went home early this morning, but he left this behind. And in the silence Mr. Bear read the note, which he had found tied to his door handle when he rose. I took Tommy's dollar. I was peeking in through a crack and saw him put it there. I was afraid to tell before, though I wanted to. I didn't care so much about Nat, but Dan is a trump and I can't stand it any longer. I never spent the money. It's under the carpet in my room, right behind the washstand. I'm awfully sorry. I am going home, and I don't think I shall ever come back. So Dan may have my things. Jack. 
it was not an elegant confession being badly written much blotted and very short but it was a precious paper to dan and when mr bear paused the boy went to him saying in a rather broken voice but with clear eyes and the frank respectful manner they had tried to teach him i'll say i'm sorry now and ask you to forgive me sir it was a kind lie dan and i can't help forgiving it but you see it did no good said mr bear with a hand on either shoulder and a face full of relief and affection it kept the boys from plaguing that that's what i did it for it made him right down miserable i didn't care so much explained dan as if glad to speak out after his hard silence how could you do it you are always so kind to me faltered nat feeling a strong desire to hug his friend and cry two girlish performances which would have scandalized dan to the last degree it's all right now old fellow so don't be a fool he said swallowing the lump in his throat and laughing out as he had not done for weeks does mrs bear know he asked eagerly yes and she is so happy i don't know what she will do to you began mr bear but got no farther for here the boys came crowding about dan in a tumult of pleasure and curiosity but before he had answered more than a dozen questions a voice cried out three cheers for dan and there was mrs joe in the doorway waving her dish towel and looking as if she wanted to dance a jig for joy as she used to do when a girl now then cried mr bear and led off a rousing hurrah which startled asia in the kitchen and made old mr robert shake his head as he drove by saying schools are not what they were when i was young dan stood it pretty well for a minute but the sight of mrs joe's delight upset him and he suddenly bolted across the hall into the parlor whither she instantly followed and neither were seen for half an hour mr bear found it very difficult to calm his excited flock and seeing that lessons were an impossibility for a time he caught their attention by telling them the fine old story of the friends whose fidelity to one another has made their names immortal the lads listened and remembered for just then their hearts were touched by the loyalty of a humbler pair of friends the lie was wrong but the love that prompted it and the courage that bore in silence the disgrace which belonged to another made dan a hero in their eyes honesty and honor had a new meaning now a good name was more precious than gold for once lost money could not buy it back and faith in one another made life smooth and happy as nothing else could do tommy proudly restored the name of the firm nat was devoted to dan and all the boys tried to atone to both for former suspicion and neglect mrs joe rejoiced over her flock and mr bear was never tired of telling the story of his young damon and pythias chapter fourteen